coming up on episode 23 of Create If Writing. There are more and more bookstores opening every day. The people that come in and how they're changed by what they read. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. You know, you've, you've poured your soul into this, but what else your soul needed to be edited? One by one, the stars are disappearing from the horizon. Hello, and welcome to Create If Writing, the podcast for writers and bloggers providing inspiration and platform building tools. I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant, and I'm so glad you're listening this week. I'm so excited to bring you an interview with Valerie Kaler of the Blue Willow Bookshop right here in Houston, Texas. She's going to talk a little bit about what it's like to run a indie bookstore day to day and also some of the great programs that they have to connect readers with writers. So that's coming up. I want to share with you guys briefly before we dive into the interview something I'm so excited about, and that is the free email course. You may know that a few weeks ago I launched a paid course, which is how to build an authentic email list. And that was something I was super excited about. It's been a long time building and I'm really happy with. And that was off the market and is now back on. I didn't do a big fancy launch or anything, but it's back up and running and you can find that in the show notes. But I also decided to create something for the people who weren't sure if they wanted to actually pay for a course about email or just didn't have the money because I know what that's like. I have a budget that I wish were larger for learning and all those kinds of things. So anyway, the free email course is a really great, not watered down course about email. And it's going to walk you through why you're sending email and kind of honing down the purposes, the content, making sure you're using the right provider, and just a lot of nitty gritty detailed things to help you do a great job with your email list. So if you want to find out more or sign up, because what are you going to lose? It's free. You can find it at freeemailcourse.com. Again, that's freeemailcourse.com. Super simple to remember. So I hope you go sign up and get some great information. I actually got an email yesterday from someone in the course and she said it was actually the best course she had taken. And I was so thrilled to hear that because that was kind of my goal is not to take away from the paid course, but also not to water it down, but simply to provide a free course that would give you lots of great information. And then if you realize there's way more that you need to do and that you want to take further steps and get more advanced strategies, then you can go ahead and purchase the How to Build an Authentic Email List course, which dives deeper into segments and autoresponders and building courses and monetization and all of those kinds of things, just, just on a deeper level. But the free email course has a ton of value as well. So I hope you guys check that out. Okay, now I'm going to dive into the interview with Valerie and Again, I'm so excited to have her on the show. And just if you're in Houston, you've got to go to the Blue Willow Bookshop. It's here on the west side of Houston, right at the corner of Derry Ashford and Memorial. Recently, they had the blog S, who just huge fan. And they've had Weird Al a few years ago. They have other smaller indie authors. They have YA authors. They do a couple of conferences. It's just a really great bookshop that does way more than sell books. So now you can listen to Valerie talk about it. But if you're in Houston, you've got to come visit. And if you're not in Houston today, make it your goal to find a local independent bookstore and make plans to head over sometime in the next week to support those indie bookstores. On this episode of Create If Writing, I'm talking with Valerie Kaler from the Blue Willow Bookshop right here in Houston, Texas. How are you doing tonight, Valerie? I'm doing very well. Well, I am so excited to talk to you because I have been a frequenter of the Blue Willow Bookshop. I think it's great to celebrate the local independent bookstores, and you have such a great bookstore because you're so active in the community. So before I say too much about your store, let me let you start and tell me the origins of your your store and how Blue Willow came to be. Okay, I'd be happy to tell you that. First of all, I would like to say that actually we're not as rare as as the press would like to make us um, out to be. There are more and more bookstores opening every day. There was a downturn definitely in the early part of the 2000s, but there's an uptick now and people are opening second stores. So that's great to hear. Yes, we are definitely seeing a renaissance. So my story is... um, a very a kind of a not an unusual story, but I am a lifelong reader. Love have always loved to read, but I never really thought about 
having my own bookstore. I did not grow up with a bookstore in my background. I was a library user. My family was library. And so I became a library user as an adult. And when my kids were little, I would go to the library and beg them to be quiet so that I could look through the adult books after we got through the children's book. I know what that's like. So in 1995, I grew up in Houston and I am, uh, in 1995, we had been living in California for five years with my husband's job and we came back to Houston and I sort of knew where I would like to live and like the boys to go to school. And we found a house that fit our uh, profile. And the next day, as we were driving down Memorial Drive, I remembered that there was a little bookstore on the corner of Memorial and Derry Ashford. And it had been there a long time. I had been in it a few times before. Uh, And uh, so fast forward, the boys start school. Both of them are in school now. And I'm thinking I don't want to do PTA because I might be the president next year. And I went in and asked the woman who owned the store, Miesbell Knott, it was called Miesbell's Books, if, if I could have a job and I would work there for free. And she said, free is good. And so I began to work for her part time while Stephen was in afternoon kindergarten. It became obvious to me that the store was in disrepair and it had been in disrepair for a number of years. And she was not in the best of health. And a couple of months after I started working there. She said, would this be something that you would like to do? Because it's time for me to pass the torch and you are an obvious candidate because you and I think alike. So crazily, I went with my husband and we scrambled up some money from friends and family and bought the bookstore. So we opened the bookstore in 1996. We changed the name uh, and uh, we've been doing that since October of 1996 ever since. So my background is in retail, though. So I, I did not have an I don't have an English degree. I don't have this grounded literature background that so many that many people do that open bookstores. My background is I grew up in the grocery business. My father and mother owned a grocery store and then subsequently two in the, in the Houston area. And so I grew up in retail. I understood retail. And I think that's the key that has kept the store open so long is not just the fact that I love books and I love to talk about books and I love to surround people with books and, and hire people who love books, but that I understand at the end of the day, it's really about a retail establishment and waiting on your customers and making sure that you're there for them. So that's, that's the key, I think. And I think that was kind of the thing when, when the chains came along and Amazon came along, that stores that were, that were open only for the love of books were not going to make it. You had to be somebody who understood hmm. the, 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 the key of retail. So that's where I came from. So that's crazy that you worked there for, did you say a couple months and then you I bought worked the there, store? I worked for a couple months and then we entered into negotiations, but it was a full year before I bought the store. So did the previous owner come in after the name change and the renovation? Absolutely. She worked for me for two years. She was ill, but and shortly after... I I bought the store. She got another diagnosis that was not a, not a good diagnosis. Mm. So uh, we knew that she um, had some life threatening illnesses. And, and so she worked for me for about two more, not quite two more years before her health failed her to actually come in. And, and it was really kind of a fun thing because she had a lot of the institutional knowledge that I didn't have. And I was bringing in new things and, and this is 1996, so you can imagine computers were coming in. And of course, the store was totally not computerized, so I was adding computers, and so it was it was very much a very different change. But um, we've grown along the way slowly but surely, and kept up with all the all the new new things that we can do to to connect people with the the, the beautiful part, which is connecting people to something that they didn't know that they wanted Hmm. before. So this is a serendipity of finding something, something that they didn't know. And then also the other thing that she had not done, but I have worked very hard to do, which is to bring authors into the city of Houston so that people can meet them and connect fans and authors and 
people who love reading and, and get people in the same room that love reading. So, Well, I've been to a couple events and, and they're really amazing. I've been to events, I think I've only been to events in the store, but you also have had some larger events. You Did you guys have Weird Al? Is it you that brought Weird Al we in? We did Weird Al. I missed I that. I interviewed him on stage at the West Houston Community Center, and it was crazy. I made my staff take pictures and send to my adult sons to say, look, your mom is cool. Um, people, <laughs> they didn't care about buying his book. They just wanted a picture with him, and he was happy to take pictures with everybody. So it was a lot of fun. So we do a lot of outreach in the community. We partner with a lot of wonderful organizations, and the the things that I am the most proud about are our three festivals that we do with uh, the Teen Book Con, the Tweens Read, and the Book One Book Fest. These festivals that that are connecting kids to authors directly. I call those our our three jewels and our crowns. So we do, but we do a lot of uh, things in outreach. We do a lot of offsite events partnering events. Well, I'm on your email list. And I think it's great you have an email list. And it's mm-hmm. a great email. I think Thank you. and maybe there are two emails I get a week, but there's there's one that's just about reading and then you have a note that you do. So there's one that I do. That's our banter. And it, that includes our my messy desk letter because my desk is always messy. And that is a, my kind of conversational letter with um, my customers and the people that I consider friends. And I always end up with, what are you reading? Because that's what we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. What are you reading right now? And then we partner with Shelf Awareness. And that is a national industry newsletter that about five years ago started a Shelf Awareness for Readers, which is a more of a public facing newsletter. And so we partner with them. And that just allows my customers to have more access to to um, reviews of all kinds of books so I just trying to get as many reviews in the in the front of people who want reviews hmm. so that's what the shelf awareness is yeah I think the last one of the last books I bought was on a recommendation from shelf awareness which was uh, vanishing girls from Lauren Oliver yes which yes. I loved. It was been in the store twice. Oh, yeah. Oh, and see, I'm, I feel like I'm like, I'm on your email list, but I'm still missing all these events. But I, I probably it's that I can't go most of the time because of just conflicts. But I have been I got to see Amanda Erie Ward, who is mm-hmm. one of my favorites. And she's a Texas writer, which is great. And then I brought my nephew uh, to see Gordon Corman. And Gordon Corman yes. was one of my favorites growing up. And then I had no idea that my nephew Caleb also loved him. I actually... I had sort of lost touch and did not realize he was still writing prolifically and still having best-selling books, which is amazing to me. So I'm like, hey, I also read him in junior high. But my, I brought my nephew who is, I guess he's going to be in eighth grade now. And he has written two novels that are, I mean, I think like 100,000 words each. So he's definitely got the bug. And that was a really neat experience because there were adults and there were younger people there. And I feel like maybe that was a little taste of of teen book con, which, you know, I'd like to hear more about because I also, I really wanted to crash that. I was like, are adults allowed to come to the teen book con? To- because I want Adults to. are totally allowed to come to teen book con. It's crashed all the time. Okay. Next year I'm going to come. We'll have about 25 to 30 uh, teen authors, Aloof Taylor High School, citywide. Last year we had over 2000 people come. It was just, wow. it was the most awesome experience for both the kids and the authors. So our big thing for all three of these is we want it to be the kids and the authors connecting. And so we ask mm. the adults to kind of take a little bit of a step back and allow those kids the time to connect with those authors and and they hear them speak and then they have their book sign and and it's just really a great day for everybody. It's just really a, mm. a bonding experience for everybody. We have a reception the night before at the bookstore for all the authors so they get to know each other and it's just it's really a lot of fun and and uh, we've met so many wonderful teen authors tween authors some of them have crossed have come to both because they write for both and um our our sweet little baby readers the little ones at the bookworm it, it's awesome well, what are what ages are for the bookworm then so the, for the bookworm it would be someone who is probably K 
K through two or three. But then, you know, when you have kids that age, as you know, there's younger siblings and sometimes older siblings, but mostly there's a lot of times there's younger siblings. So we have families come to that. Whereas when you come to the teen, there's not so much, the entire family doesn't show up for the day. But in the bookworm, the entire family comes. It's just the morning. We don't go through lunch. And there'll be mom, dad, grandma, baby in the stroller, two kids that are there because their their librarian told them this was going to be so much fun. (laughs) So it's really a family affair for uh, the Bookworm Book Fest. That's so neat. And, you know, what what I love about this is – that you are doing something so special, you are connecting. And you are connecting your authors with readers and your readers with authors, even at a young age, where I think, you know, young adults, a huge market, but I don't see a lot of people sort of taking that time to connect. They're like, well, I don't really want to deal with teens, like I'll sell books to them, or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a great market for selling things, but I don't want to be near them. And and they're a little, admittedly awkward, but really (laughs) awesome, too. Um, my, you know, my husband's a youth pastor, so we are we have You're teens around a lot. <laughs> yes, we are, and it's actually one of my favorite times of life. And I feel like I love young adult literature because it, there are so many big events that happen in such a tiny space of time. Like they are just packed in there. You know, changes to your body, changes to you know your friends. There are just these big milestones that pass, and I feel like the rest of your life they tend to be a little more spread out. They don't have to be. I mean, you could. Yeah, have a lot of big things happen in a year, but you will definitely have a lot of things happening, and you know, in a very short span. As far away as I am from that, those years, I remember them so very clearly. Mm-hmm. And I have two grown sons. I remember their teenage years very clearly, and I have multiple teenagers who have over the years worked at the bookstore. And so I remember their teenage years and, and were there. And, and I made a mm. very conscious decision that I would always have a, at least three, sometimes four teenagers working at the store. My father hired teenagers at his grocery store and, and he was their father figure. I remember this distinctly. They considered him mm. their father, his, their father. And, and, he was there for hmm. them. They, and that's what I wanted to replicate is, is a place for someone to have their first job that they could feel comfortable in and safe in and do that. But you're right. It's such a small amount of time and they do such quirky, weird things that you just have to laugh. You just, you just have to laugh at them. It's just so much <laughs> fun to be around them. And it keeps us young too. As we age, it keeps us young. So, so now my sons are grown. I don't have grandchildren yet. They're not married, but I'm still continuing with the young kids. And it's just, it's fun. That's such a fun part of the bookstore is to be around them as they, as they kind of navigate their way through high school and, and go off to college and they come back and they're grown up and it just, it's fun. So it's fun to be around them also at Team BookCon because um, they're smart. They're smart kids, and they have some filters on, but not all, all of them yet. Not all the adult filters that we put on ourselves. So. Which is both good and bad, I think, and <laughs> depending yeah. on the context. But, you know, I mean, I would have loved that when I was young, you know, the chance, you know, like my nephew got to meet Gordon Corman and talk to him and say, I wrote a book. And can I ask you? I mean, he asked him a question, and Gordon Corman was so respectful and kind. And, you know, not every author necessarily is like that, I'm sure. But, you know, just to get a chance to connect with that person on the other side of of the pages. That's just such a unique and neat thing and so rich. So I, I love that you are connecting the community in that way. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what kind of like a typical day is like, because we were talking about this before <laughs> I started recording, just about how it's not necessarily what you'd expect. So maybe the day to day. And then you know, if you have any neat moments that you remember from from just, you know, any time since the store has been open of neat connections that were made or fun stories of connecting with readers. So a typical day always starts with an issue. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like my day starts, too. It seems like at least, at least lately it always starts with an issue. You know, as with any kind of retail, with any kind of business, there's always some technical issue you have to deal with or 
physical plant issue you have to deal with. Um, today it was the lights in the back room and some some transferring of, of website things, but uh, you know, so a typical day it involves at least one thing that you have to fix at mm. the bookstore. Uh, and then I do spend time, I do have to spend time. I do all the buying and, um, as the stores get larger, as you might meet people from larger bookstores, larger independent bookstores, a lot of them have buyers and the buyers are in charge of buying the front list, which is the forthcoming books. And then they have inventory managers that keep track of what the replacements are going to be. And And I have an inventory person who works with me very carefully and closely. She does not call herself a manager, but she is. So she replaces all the inventory. She and I work together to do that. But I do all of the buying from adult to kids. And that's, from what I understand from my friends in the independent books business, not all that usual for larger stores, much more often for smaller stores. And so I spend a a good amount of time working on that, making sure that we have all the forthcoming books coming and that whole channel is moving. Um, And then we have our social media that we have to deal with. And um, I get a lot of incoming email from uh, indie authors. And you had asked me about indie authors and I get a lot of that. I get quite a bit of it during the week. I pro- I think I got maybe 10 today. So that's pretty wow. usual for me to get 10 queries. Um, two of them were from local authors. Okay. Um, if they are not local, I figure they found me somehow on the internet. And if it's not something that I'm interested in and it's not directly addressed to me, I just delete it. I'm sorry. I cannot keep up with that. Um, but I do deal with a uh, but try to look at each person's email and see if it fits my store. What I find with indie authors is that um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of connection between what we're doing in the store and what they're writing. Hmm. So today I was reading one that came from a, a local author, but the novel that this person had written and was writing and had done um let's pass the grammatical errors out of the way that was the first thing but that's not a genre that we sell in stores so okay. so i'm i i deal with that and try to carefully and nicely say to them you know we have to be we you need to be cognizant of what we do sell here in the store and hmm. if we don't sell that genre that's just not going to go so um i do a lot with that on a daily basis because With the proliferation of people who can publish their own books, I I just see so much of it. And and it just seems to be more and more every day. Um, What I see selling in that market are targeted, possibly somebody who has an idea that they are talking about and people are talking about. And so they're writing about it. Novels, not so much, not, not so much in the novels. Um, there's just so much out there that is published by a traditional publisher that has been edited by a traditional editor that the, that the indie stuff just can't, can't blast through that because they don't have the, they don't have the published, they don't have the editing edge that the others do. Well, and you'd think, because I know that there are some great indie authors who do take such great care with their work, but it's hard because then there are the people that come around and send you these emails all the time. And they're, you know, if you're skimming through and reading the first couple yeah. pages and finding grammatical errors, because I'm assuming you're not going to read a whole thing, or even in the email, right. if they have that, I just right. think more care could be taken. And that just gives all independence long name. I mean, I feel like for me, I kind of see some some hope and some excitement in the fact that there are there's some more options other than the sort of traditional gatekeepers, but that also means when you lose the gatekeepers in that way, anything can get in. <laughs> so that's not a good thing. Right. And that is very true. That's a good way to put it because because I, I as much as I read that these people are yeah. the gatekeepers, and they are. I'm I don't I don't doubt that they are. As much as they are the gatekeepers, 
But they also are the gatekeepers to keep the slough out. And there's there a lot of that. So there's just a ton of that. So you're con- you you read each one of these consciously thinking, could this mm. be the diamond in the rough? Could this be the diamond in the rough? Could this be the diamond in the rough? Yeah. And rarely, rarely is it the diamond in the rough. Rarely, it just, it's, and it breaks my heart because I know this is their baby and you, no one tells it, wants to tell anybody <laughs> that their baby is ugly <laughs> when it is. Um, and it is ugly, but there's just, it, it's out there. And in that, you know, in a way that makes my heart kind of sad because I, I think, you know, you've you've poured your soul into this, but quite honestly, your yeah. soul needed to be edited. And here's the thing that I keep I tell I tell people. So I'm not did not come from the I like I said, not the English background, not the literature background. So every single thing that I write has to be edited because mm-hmm. I have the worst grammar in the entire world. And so I have staff that that edits my grammar. And so I know yeah. that you need to be edited from a first person. You need to be edited. And that's the thing that I think is hard about for the indie author, because I want mm. you to shine, but I can't sell your book. If there's 16 bajillion grammatical errors in it, it just, it's not going to go. Well, and you know, I feel like for, for people who really want to make it in the, in the indie industry, I mean, they really need some good eyes. I mean, that's the first thing I think they mm-hmm. need somebody, not the friend who's going to read it or the mom and say, it's amazing. What a wonderful job. You're a writer. You need the person who can read and say, you know what? I think if you worked on these things and then hired an editor to deal with all your mistakes, that it could be something. Yeah. Or the person is like, you know what? I think you should just enjoy writing for fun and keep your day job. And, you know, not that actually writing means you're going to quit your day job anyway, but. But. That's so, that's so hard, but it's so true. I, I, we struggle with this. So, so here we are doing our retail thing, connecting people to books. People come in, they want books and we talk to them about books and we're excited about this one, excited about that one. And then I go in the back room and have to tell somebody what you wrote is garbage. Hmm. Go back. And I, I, it's hard to tell someone this because people don't actually really always listen to you. Sam. No, that's true. But that's it. But that's the indie. The indie thing is, we've we've talked this over time and again. The independent bookstores, when we all get together, we talk about this, mm. you know, and because we want to encourage it, because we know there's a diamond somewhere, and yet at the same time we're like, it takes so much of our time. Mm. It takes so much of our time. So it is an ongoing struggle for us. And we're not trying to be, we're not trying to poo-poo people or say you're, you're stupid or you're dumb. We're just looking for that one, the right one. Yeah. There's a lot of, them. and so, so now we're being agent editor. We're being the agent editor basically. And that's a hard, that's a lot of hats to wear. I mean, it's hard yeah. for the people who just have those singular jobs, but for you, yeah as a bookseller, but I love that you are willing to consider. And I feel like, you know, if if you're listening to this and you're an independent writer, I think the message for you is it's not that you can't do great work as an indie author, but you need to bring your work up to the caliber of the greats. And, Mm -hmm. and if you're not doing that, um, then work on your craft. I mean, there, there are some things I feel like you maybe can't work on, but I feel like for a lot of people you can. And please find a copy editor, please. (laughs) Yes, there are so many. I interviewed one a few months ago, actually, and I'll leave her link in the show notes. But she, you know, when I talked with her, I said, when do you need to edit? Because I'm a blogger. And I said, when, when should, when do people need to edit? And she said, well, maybe, I mean, you can self edit, you know, your blog post for the most part, although you know yourself. And so you may want somebody to take a look. But anytime you're considering charging somebody money or, you know, if you're doing a guest post for somewhere else, like you definitely need, you mm-hmm. know, whether that's a great critical eye from a friend or to pay somebody. And if it's a book and you want to put it in print, you pay someone. I, I mean, this is baffling to me, but, um, you know, again, so Indies out there, there, there is hope for you, but create quality work and hire an editor, both of those things. So, uh, well, I think we sidetracked, which is great on your day. So your typical day, it, it a lot of emails is what I'm getting and <laughs> fixing things. A lot of emails. 
fixing things, um, talking to customers, uh, working with the staff. You know, there's a lot of a lot of um, detail that goes into what comes in the store and um, the correct way to account for it. I also do all the buying of our mm. gift items, and that's that's a kind of a out there kind of a thing. So we sell journals and stationery and games and puzzles and all of that. You know, you have to kind of figure out what the right mix is and what you're going to do and and receive that all in. And that's all you know. You want to get it all in there so that you're you're in incredibly wonderful bookkeeper doesn't quit on you <laughs> and figures out um how uh, figures out you know what how to handle all the invoices and you know there's just a lot of details there's always a you know merchandising you know what goes with what and there's just it's just it fills the day and before you know it mm. You're exhausted. You're it's time to go home and then you have So if people are thinking like, there's ah. a glamorous, you know, you sit around and read and just talk all day author <laughs> about authors with customers, then that's no, not there so is much. Not, there, the, here's what the glamorous part about. Uh, there's no glamorous part about running the bookstore day to day. The glamorous part is that you get to meet awesome authors all the time. And I tell people this. Every author, there have been, I can probably count on less than a handful authors that I thought, mm, I don't really care if I ever meet them again. I, they all have a, a wonderful story mm. to tell. They all have a great story to tell. And I just, I love listening to their story and it, it makes their, their craft and their, their book come alive to me. And I just, just, it just rejuvenates you every single time. I'm, it's just, and even if it's a book I've not even read, I'm, I just, I'm standing there, I'm thinking, that is really cool. And you thought of this, and that's really cool. And that, that to me is, is I think the, 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 that's the payback for me is, is that part where I get to connect with the author. And then I hear the kids or the adult clamoring over their favorite author. And, and then you think, okay, that's really cool. And then when you have kids come in or adults come in and they go, you got me back into reading. Hmm. I'm, I'm going to, I, I love this book and you show them five books and they go, I'll take all oh, five wow. of those. And you think, yes, they, they believe in me. Parents come in they They just look at you and they look at their kid and they go, and I just take their kid off hmm. and we go off and we do our thing. That's, that's the thing that, that makes the day that, that kind of gets all the other riffraff stuff that has to do with, running a bookstore, which most people don't think is happening. So I, I have to laugh because a number of years ago when my sons were back in high school, the principal was over and she, she was shopping and looking at books. And she said, you have my dream job. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, you do not have my dream job. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no. The principal of the high school. So so lots of people think it's a dream job and, and it it is for the right person. Mm. But I, I do want to I do want would like to kind of steer people away from the idea that you're gonna be sitting there reading books and when and drinking tea and when your customer comes in you're gonna be talking about books. Yes, and I'm sure that happens, but <laughs> but clearly there's just a lot of business to attend to. And I think, you know, there's a parallel between writers, you know, people think, Oh, you're a writer. And I don't know what they imagine. You know, I've been a writer long enough that I can't even think what I used to imagine. But you know, maybe sitting, you know, in movies, I feel like, you know, you've got Johnny Depp in a movie, and yeah, he's going crazy, but he's in a house alone, and he has time and he can drink coffee or whiskey. He's writing with his on a, on a pad with a with a cartridge pen. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's so much work that goes into it that's that's not glamorous there are so many details there are so many edits there are so many you know things that you have to do on the promotional side of things and you know emails to answer and just really basic things that are not glorious and sometimes even i really enjoy the process of writing but some people don't and it really is a struggle and it's it's a fight to get the words on the page and you know they're in there and they want to get them out but it's a struggle and so yeah there's there's nothing probably super glamorous about any job. You could 
consider here, but certainly there's some jobs that do have that sound like, oh, you're a, you own a bookshop. How wonderful. That sounds great. You know, so it's good to hear there's a lot more business in there. And you sound like you have a, you have a good handle on that. It sounds like, well, well, are there any times that have been, you know, kind of difficult where you thought, I don't know if I can do it and, and had, you know, kind of those heart moments that pulled you through? Yeah, I've actually always thought I could do it. You know, again, going back to my retail roots, working in the grocery store, you know, it's, it really is getting up in the morning and going to the bookstore and opening it. And just knowing that you told people you would open the bookstore at 930 and you're, by God, that bookstore is going to open at 930. And, and that, and that actually goes back to my drama roots. I have a degree in drama and I had, and I had a cut, I had a directing we took a class in direction, directing plays, and this professor was mighty hard. And he liked me because I showed up every day and I did the homework. Mm. And he looked at the class and he said, if you say the curtain goes up at eight o'clock, that curtain needs to go up at eight o'clock. Mm. You need to be ready. And I've taken that to heart. So if you say you open at 930, you better get yourself up there and open at 930. Whatever you feel like, whatever the circumstances are, you need to open at 930 because that's what you said you would do. Hmm. And I think that's that's the mo- that's important and it served us well in the bookstore is that we're there. People come in and we're there for them, whatever they want, what what whatever they need, whether, whether it's validation on something that they they've already thought they wanted when they came in the door or whether it's something they found when they're in the bookstore by in the store either on their own or with our suggestion that's what they want that's people want to talk about what they're reading and and what they found and and we're going to validate it whether it's something that's our personal favor or not it doesn't matter that doesn't matter it's the validation that Hey, that looks like a really fun book, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Hmm. So, well, I like to kind of close by asking people what inspires them, and I I did not remember to e- email that to you, <laughs> so I'm going to talk for a second while you while you think about that. But um, you know, I I think I've heard. I've been to, this is kind of my year of being really nerdy and I've been to a lot of conferences and I started kind of doing two podcast interviews. So I'm listening to a lot of great and inspiring people and something that I keep hearing again and again, I hear a lot about, about passion, about doing, you know, kind of going where your heart is. And then the thing that pairs with that is you work really hard and you show up and, you know, people who are successful, one thing that they all have in common is they show up. You know, like you're saying, when the when the curtain goes up, you you arrive and you work really hard at what you love. And so it sounds like you are are in that space, which I love. And I absolutely love the Blue Willow Bookshop. And if you are listening and you are in Houston, I hope that you go by. It is on the west side of town, right at the corner of Memorial and Derry Ashford, which is actually my well, I used to live about a mile from there. We've moved since, but so it's, you can take the Katy Freeway and exit Derry Ashford um, headed south and get down there within, you know, a few minutes of exiting. And it's a great store. If you sign up for their email list, you can find out about all these fabulous author events and conferences. And if you do go in and hear about the store from here, mention the podcast so that Valerie can know where you came from, which is exciting because sometimes these podcasts, you speak to people and then you just send it out there and you have no idea. So it'd be great to hear that. So with this little break I've given you, do you have anything that's inspiring you this week? It does not have to be book related. It can be any kind of related, but what's what's giving you inspiration this week? This week I am inspired by a lot of different things. So I re- lost my father recently mm-hmm. and he really ins well, he is my mentor. Mm-hmm. And he inspired me. Well, first of all, talk about show up every day. Mm-hmm. That man got in the car every day, no matter how he felt, and went to his grocery store. But what inspires me is is the people that come in and how they are changed by what they read. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm I'm reading a book right now, which is set kind of at the beginning of World War II, and it's got you know people in. United States and people in Europe and 
And I'm thinking about how um, we are inspired by what we read to change the world. I mean, we are inspired by, and, and we're not, I'm not talking about changing the world like this huge thing. We're going to go out and win the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm talking about in our neighborhood, mm. in our city, because of what we've read. And it doesn't need to be nonfiction. It doesn't need to be a, a screed about gun control or anything like that. Actually, novels it, it, it inspires us the most mm. because we read about people in their lives and we think we empathize with them, we think about them, and we are inspired to speak our mind, mm. vote a different way, um, embrace somebody that we would not have otherwise embraced. I mean, it, as I get older and as I read more, my thoughts on life become, as I say, grayer because there is no black and white. Hmm. So I become, and I think readers, real readers of fiction and nonfiction, but really fiction, they become grayer in their thoughts because they can see both sides because that's what a great author does. They yeah. make you see both sides and they make you see that the uh, that the narrator, the good person is maybe not good, but maybe not bad. And the bad person is maybe bad, but maybe we're only not good. And hmm. and they're all gray and, and we can all see this. And, and this is what makes us think that people are not all good or all bad. I love that. And I think you're so right that, you know, when I think about books that have impacted me, I'm thinking about novels and, and a lot of them, you know, novels I read when I was very young and I come back to them again and again. And then some that I read yearly again and again that are, you know, whether there's a young adult or not, but it's novels. And I think readers, they smell that preachy kind of novel. Like we don't do didactic, like teaching novels anymore. I mean, there was a time in history where that was a thing, but that's not a thing now. And I think, you know, the authors who are really successful are not doing that. They're not taking their characters and saying, I'm going to teach you a lesson with this character. <laughs> they're, exactly. they're letting their characters live and breathe and be characters. And then there are so many more rich lessons. And I feel like the books really do connect on so many other points where when people try to write those teachy books, and I feel like I'm trying to think who does this. I feel like when I read celebrity novels, which I really don't do. Um, every now and then I'll pick one up and read like three pages or like those celebrity children's books mm -hmm. most of the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I forgot. It. I I think I saw a video of maybe it was Madonna reading a children's book she'd written. And I just wanted, I don't know what I wanted to do, but it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the preachiest book I've ever heard. And I, I don't know. But anyway, you're not going to preach. You're not going to preach to the kids or the, or the adults. A good, yeah. a good, a good picture book is is something that both the adult and reader and the child can relate to. That's that's a good picture book. A good picture book is I'm reading this. Can I read this a thousand times? Okay, mm. yeah, I can read it a thousand times. Okay, I'm ready. Because that's a good picture book. Yes. And that's the thing I think the celebrities don't get because I've, you know, then their books, I feel like they're the most guilty of this because it's like, oh, well, you know, they'll sell. And so they get a deal. And then it's some kind of like, let's make sure every single person knows they're different and it's okay. And there's right. a way to do that. Right. And it's not the way they, they do it. So anyway, that was my little aside about <laughs> agreeing with you about novels and, and not being preachy, but just, yeah, seeing that great. And I love the way Thank you put you. that. Thank you. It's time for dinner. I think in, in the emptiness Kaler household. So. I am actually doing that as well. Cause my kids are <laughs> finally quiet. So we're going to go have a little thanks. quiet time. Well, thanks again. And I would love to connect with you more and, if anyone's in Houston listening, you've got to head over to the Blue Willow Bookshop, sign up for the email list online, and hit some of these great conferences they are putting on, which are just really stellar for our community. October's almost over, and the dark nights are closing in again. Oh. I loved getting to hear the behind the scenes of running an independent bookstore with Valerie Kaler. The Blue Willow Bookshop really is amazing and has fantastic events. So if you're in Houston, as I've said already, go check out the bookstore and tell her that I sent you. I think there are takeaways that we can all get from what Valerie had to say about running the store, whether it's hiring an editor and making sure that you've got 
the best product, whether you're putting up a blog post or writing a book or an ebook, you want your best product. You want to use an editor. You want to have things polished. I think that's something huge that, you know, I took away from her. We should all know that, but I think sometimes it's easy to sort of take some of those shortcuts and her words just reminded me, no, if it's something important that you're doing, you need to take the care that it needs. But also, I just loved hearing about the connections and thinking from a writer's perspective and also a reader's perspective of how important that connection with the audience is and how much that matters. So I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. And I also hope you head over to freeemailcourse.com to get started on your free email course today. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, I hope you have an inspired week. Shout